TNT Filmways presents Championship Drag Racing. Hello from Green Valley Raceway at Smithfield, Texas, between Dallas and Fort Worth, the home of the world champions. I'm Pete Talmadge, and we're about to witness the year-end event, perhaps the most important gathering of the top stars of the nation's fastest-growing sport, drag racing. The AHRA's World Point Championship Finale races will get underway in just a moment. It's a warm but humid day in north central Texas with rain clouds overhead and scattered showers reported within just a few miles of the track. Still, almost 8,000 fans have turned out today to witness the American Hot Rod Association's Grand American World Point Championships here at Green Valley Raceway. And with any kind of luck at all with the weather, we're bound to see a great show because the biggest names in the sport have gathered to do battle for thousands of dollars in prize money. Among the top contenders, are the reigning world champion Doc Spence in his Scoot and Cuda. Fritz Callier of the CKC racing team of San Antonio with a fiberglass fastback Chevy. The Hoffman and Conifax entry, Bad News Chevy 2. The up and coming local favorite, Ray Caps in a Dodge at the Headhunter. And Doug Nash with his exciting super light Ford Bronco. The pre-race feelings are that the big wars will be fought between Ford and Chevrolet. And leading the attack for Pomoco will be Gas Ronda with his 427 cubic inch Mustang. Mr. Reflexes himself, Dick Harrell, is the local favorite among the Chevy boys. I think in order to make sure you understand more fully exactly what's happening on an AHRA sanctioned 1,320 foot long drag strip, we should show you exactly what it looks like from an aerial view. Now, the staging area where all of our stock cars come from are right here. This is the walkover bridge, which you see many times in the picture, and the cars go under it in these lane fashions. There are seven lanes from which the cars may come. They are brought to the start line where the flagman uh, sets the electronic controls, which will be explained to you in the program, and uh, then they are issued forth from here, and they travel down this 1,320-foot strip. Then they continue on up 2,500 more feet approximately runoff area, to allow these faster cars to slow down if their parachute should happen to fail them and maybe the brakes aren't exactly good enough. At the top of the hill, they turn and come back to the pit area in their return road, naturally. Here is the pit area, 40 acres of paved and asphalted work surface and also parking area. The pit area, the track, the stands, and now let's take a look at the race. They're bringing out the factory experimental fuel class first. These stock body dragsters are built strictly for racing with extensive modifications to the engines, light fiberglass and aluminum to replace the heavier steel in the original bodies, and the wheel bases have been altered to throw most of the car's weight onto those 11-inch wide racing slick tires, which both of these drivers are now burning in. It'll be the Ford Mustang and gas runner in the far lane or pit side against Rafel Shields and the Chevrolet on the near or spectator side. Ronda is from Azusa, California, and his 2,480-pound fiberglass, beautifully molded Mustang is powered by the new 427 cubic inch single overhead cam Hemi Ford engine, developing about 900 horsepower with its nitromethane boost. His competition, Rafael Shields, the flying Texan, is driving a 2,490-pound 1965 Chevrolet, which was built about three months ago with this meat in mind. Its engine is 426 cubic inches. Both cars have automatic transmissions and live on the exotic nitromethane and alcohol instead of conventional gasoline. Now the flagman, Ski Chambers, has them lined up for the start, and here's the first big race of the day. It's the Ford away first at the green light. And still in the lead, it's the Mustang over the Chevy. The winner is Gas Rump with an elapsed time of 9.41 seconds at 155.17 miles per hour. There are 12 cars entered in this class, and the next set is coming out already. It's Ray Caps, another driver from Mesquite, Texas, as was Shields, in a topless 65 Dodge called the Headhunter. 
against a Beaumont, Texas-based blue Chevy 2 of Randy Blackwell the Rogue. Blackwell's two-door, weighing 2,600 pounds, runs with a big version of the 396-inch engine, injected and with an automatic transmission. Caps relies on the Hemi head 426 cubic inch Mopar mill and weighs about 2,500 pounds overall. Now, watch him! like it's in trouble. There's Caps crossing the finish track first with a 10.02 elapsed time and 142.16 miles per hour for a victory over Randy Blackwell, who was slowed down apparently by mechanical difficulties. The third race in this first round of FX Fuel pits the CKC racing team against Jack Robbins of Fort Worth in a 65 Chevrolet with a new 427 cubic inch engine. That's the CKC car on camera now. And if you've wondered just how thin those fiberglass bodies can get, look at how the engine vibrations are rippling the sides of this Chevy. The driver of Rich Callier is looking around for Robbins, and frankly, so are we. Well, they're waving Callier up alone now, and we can see why. Robbins' Chevy has failed to fire. He's being pushed back out of contention. So it'll be CKC by itself, and any way he goes, he's a winner. Fritz Callier in a single car race, and he puts on a good show, cutting the lights with a 9.96 ET at 139.96 miles per hour. We're still in the first round of the Factory Experimental Fuel Championships with the world champion Scootin' Cuda, 1966 Plymouth, piloted by Doc Spence in Kansas City, Missouri, now warming up. That Cuda is sponsored by the Seitz brothers, and that's their pitman Bob Mannion squirting benzene on the rear tires for better traction. Their competition is the bad news Chevy 2 of Hoffman and Conamax out of Salina, Kansas. A super sport 427 threat to the Cuda's chances. A Plymouth moves with all the power of a 426 Hemi head engine and weighs in at just under 2,500 pounds. And these boys are close. But then so is the team of Hoffman and Conifets with the bad news Chevy 2. Running better than 50% of nitromethane and alcohol, this car, which is almost 2,600 pounds heavy, boasts around 750 horsepower. Keep an eye on those lights in the foreground of your picture. They'll go from red to a small white light for each lane, and then flash green to start this race between the Scoot and Cuda in the spectator lane and bad news on the pit side. This is one to watch. Mopar versus General Motors with a $1,000 pot of gold at the end of the day for the ultimate winner in FX Fuel. And they are ready to race. It's the bad news. Inside the side of the on the people's side closest to the camera. Now it's Doc Spence across the left line first with an elapsed time of 9.69 seconds at a top end speed of 150.25 miles per hour, fast enough to really need that parachute to help him stop. Now pushing out for the fifth race of this round of factory experimental competition is the team of Erickson and Willard of Wichita, Kansas with the 65 Chevelle. They'll come head on against the Euless, Texas driver Ken Hare, who's quick as a rabbit in a 65 Chevy 2 weighing only 2,400 pounds. You can see how the crew now is assisting the engine start of the Erickson and Willard car by putting some of that horsepower doubling nitro directly into the injector stacks of this 427 cubic inch power plant while the flagman Ski Chambers waits patiently for both cars to get to the line. But wait a minute, that's the race director in the white shirt, Jimmy Kirk. And it looks as though Erickson and Willard will have the track to themselves as Ken Hare can't get his car running and the decision is to let the other man go it alone. You can understand why that rule must be enforced, painful as it is to the management of the track. If there were no time control, the first car started might overheat. Waiting for the competition to come out. As it is, these high-powered temperamental automobiles require as much as a full hour to cool down between each race to the high heat generated within those fire-breathing engines. So in a single run, Erickson and Willard turns the quarter mile in 9.99 seconds at 143.54 miles per hour. Now here's a man with a tough road to hold. It's Bruce Winters in the Beverly's B 64 Dodge against Mr. Chevy himself, Dick Harrell, formerly of New Mexico, now from Chicago. And this 66 Chevy 2 Super Sport and the guy who drives it are considered one of the toughest combinations to beat in drag racing today. 
That Dodge, owned by the husband and wife team of Bruce and Beverly winners from Waco, Texas, is 3,000 pounds of eager move are anxious to beat this former Southwesterner, and now they're out! Sekiro, current holder of the World Point Championship title, takes the lead as they go by the grandstand, and through the ice first, it's Mr. Chevrolet with an ET of 9.83 and 138.24 miles per hour. You know, while drag racing in its simplest form is two cars charging side by side toward a finish line, with the first car across winning for the record and to check performances, elapsed times of the runs and velocities reached are carefully measured. To see how this is done, let's go into the heart of the operation, the timing tower. It takes a minimum of four persons to efficiently handle the workload of the Green Valley Tower, with three being of primary importance. The announcer, who sets the pace of the action, controls the traffic, starts the race, and reads the ET or elapsed times clocks. The miles per hour clock operator and the electro writer. The other keeps the record straight and is in telephone contact with the other work areas of the track. While the flagman brings the cars towards the start line, the announcer identifies them over the public address system for the benefit of the spectators. He is at this time also checking the cars for the required safety equipment and the track to be certain that it's clear. Then when the cars have staged and the flagman indicates both drivers are ready, the announcer punches the green light to start the race. As the cars cross the start line, they interrupt the beam of light in two electric eyes, which sets the elapsed time indicators in motion. The Krondex timers count in seconds, tenths, hundreds, and thousands of seconds, but normally they are read only to the nearest hundred. In this example, they indicate an elapsed time of 22.02 seconds. At the completion of the quarter-mile dash, the cars break the beams of two more sets of eyes, placed 132 feet apart in what is called the traps. The time spent by the cars in this space is flashed back to the miles per hour clocks and is computed from a chart. The operator gives it audibly as top end speed. While this information is being read over the PA, it is permanently recorded in longhand by the girl at the electrowriter, a device which simultaneously duplicates whatever she writes onto a slip of paper on a similar machine in a booth at the pit end of the return road. This record of his performance is handed to each driver as he returns to the pit area. The race drivers, the spectators, and the journalists all depend upon the information which is gathered here. So you can see how in this highly technical sport, the timing tower is the heart of the operation. At every drag race, there are eliminator brackets set up to decide the quickest cars in several various categories. These cars are the champions of their respective classes, and here's how they become champions. This is the factory production A-Class Final, with John Turley of Sherman, Texas, racing David Girard in the Texas Thunderbolt. Turley drives a 420 horsepower 426 cubic inch Plymouth. The Texas Thunderbolt from Irving is a 427 Plymouth. They're off evenly with Girard on the near side in the lead at the halfway point. Gerard through the ice first at 117.95 miles per hour and 11.90 seconds elapsed time. The Texas Thunderbolt then takes the factory production A-Class trophy and earns the right to compete in the Mr. Scott eliminations later today. For any car you see cruising the streets of your hometown, you may expect to find that same kind of car, the drag strip. There is a class for everyone. No, we haven't slowed the camera down. These VWs are just plain not going as fast as the competition you've seen up to this point. That's Joe Lemming of Farmers Branch, Texas, in the pit lane, racing Jesse Kensinger of Fort Worth in the Volkswagen nearest the camera for the flood class time. And the victory goes to Kensinger at 22.66 elapsed time at 55.07 miles per hour. Here are two more quick ones, running in the factory experimental A-Stock class finals. It's Joe Muscanero of Arlington on the pit lane with a car called Stubo, and Tommy Richardson of Plainview in the bright red Dodge closest to the camera. Both cars are 1965 Cornettes with the big Hemi head engines. Muscanero was first off the line, but watch Richardson play catch-up. It's the spectator lane coming from behind. And Richardson wins it!
Here's the perfect example of the exception to the rule that the quickest car away wins. The Dodge on the near side actually won the race after a late start by going ahead in the last before the finish line. So it's Tommy Richardson, the winner, at 11.81 elapsed time at 122.78 miles per hour. Here are the first cars to race in the exciting second round of the factory experimental fuel cars. This is the Scootin Cuda, a solid pre-race favorite, piloted by Doc Spence, a practicing physician from Kansas City, Missouri, against Ray Capps of Mesquite, Texas, a relatively unknown driver of a 65 Dodge called the Headhunter. Capps is his own mechanic, and he doesn't go in for the heavy traction master and a lot of burnings, but his reactions are quick, and he's a plenty competent driver. So it's Ray Capps on the far side and Doc Spence in the spectator lane, and here we go. Hey, the headhunter got the jump on Spence after like pulling him on the full length ahead of the start. Now Spence has to come from behind. But he didn't do it. And Ray Capps pulls off the upset of the meet, beating the Cuda with a 10.02 elapsed time and 142.18 miles per hour. Spence trying to overcome that hole shot by Capps. Turn to better ET, 965 and 147.24 miles per hour at the big end, but he was second at the finish line, and that's where the race is decided. Let's go talk to the men in this race. What have you got to say after that run, Doug? Oh, he knew the track a little better. He really did, you know, and that was quite a surprise, and I, I think we were all just a little bit flabbergasted. Had you expected any kind of difficulty from Easterling and Camps? Not hardly. <laughs> His car isn't as pretty as yours, and... You were rated up right up there with Ron, then Harold, and everyone else. Well, everybody can have a chance. That's why everybody's out here. Well, now, when you're both traveling as fast as y'all do, what is the real secret? Is it off the line? Off the line, first couple of feet. Here's the headhunter from Mesquite, Ray Caps, and you really got a big head in your bag this time. You're not kidding. <laughs> I never felt better. <laughs> That's quite a victory. One of your biggest, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's my best. It is. You, we, we've seen your car around quite a lot, but... I can't recall you ever winning over $100 before. It looks like you got six at least in the bag now. I never run, want to run what you brung me before. Maybe this to change my look. I've never been so proud in my life. <laughs> what do you owe your victory to? What actually won the race for you? I guess that hole shot I got on it. When I pulled up there, I made my man up. I was going to leave before he did, so I just left him. That's all it was to it. Well, what is in your car, Ray? It's just stock 426 Hemi. I've run it for a year with the same engine, same rings, pistons, and everything. Never been overhauled. How much of a charge do you have in your engine now? Eighty. Eighty percent. Now, this roll cage is new. We remember you used to have a regular top on it. When did you well, modify your body like this? The factory made, I mean, uh, AHRA made you put a full roll cage in it, so I put it in. I had to have it, so I put it in there. Now, another proud moment for you is when you realize that this car is all yours. Easterling used to be a partner, and now you bought the whole car, didn't you? Yes, sir. It's all mine. When did you make that move? Oh, about a month ago. So, so now this, this headhunter, and how did you come by that name, by the way? Our buddy of mine said we put that on there. He'd have it done. So I said, we'll just have it put on there. So that's the way we did it. Well, you, you'd be considered a local small driver in a big car, but now, of course, you're a big champion. But until this moment, you were not. What did you think when you drew sights at Doc Spence as a, as a man on the other lane? Well, I said, it's all over now, but I'm going to see if he can beat me to the other end. I figured it was all over, but it wasn't. How is your car running? It's not running good as it used to. It's getting weak, but it'll be better next week. But you're going to give him a race, are you? Yes, sir. I'll give him a good run. I'll give spectators something to watch. Well, we're, we're real happy for you. Ray Caps yeah. from Mesquite, Texas, Hot Rod Exchange out of Dallas, the headhunter. Congratulations and thank you very much. We appreciate it now. Sure do. And I enjoyed it. Still in factory experimental fuel competition, here's Gas Ronda with that great looking Mustang toting a potent single overhead cam Ford Hemi engine. Ready to race Fritz Callier in the CKC Fastback from San Antonio. 427 cubic inches of General Motors power. And both cars weigh right at 2,400 pounds. It's Ford in the spectator lane and Chevrolet on the pit side. And this race is on. Hey, CKC, a whole shot on Ronda. Could this be another upset? No, the Mustang is pulling ahead of the halfway point. And finish.
finishes in the lead by a length. A thrilling race with a spectator side gas run of the winner at 154.37 miles per hour and 9.28 seconds elapsed time. Fritz Callier, who almost took a tall one with that great start, finished with a 10.20 ET. Meanwhile, back on the line, it's Dick Harrell of Chicago, Mr. Reflexes, with the Chevy 2 Supersport on the pit lane, getting ready to run against Erickson and Willard of Wichita, Kansas, in the Silver Chevelle. And while both of these cars burn in their tires and clean out those 27 cubic inch engines, look at the skies of the threatening rain all day, and we're just hoping it'll hold off until we finish these races. Back on the track, we should mention that for safety's sake, the factory experimentals are required to carry full roll cages, scatter shields, they must be 1962 models or younger, and weigh at least 2,400 pounds. Otherwise, anything goes. And these two are a couple of the fastest. You remember in the first round, Harold beat the Beverly's B with a 9.83 ET, and Erickson and Willard turned a 9.99 on a lone run when Ken Harry's competition failed to fire. Now the flagman's bringing them to the line, and we are about to watch another great race. Dick Harrell on the far side, and Erickson and Willard in the spectator lane. And that quick start saved him because the loser actually had a better time turning the quarter in 9.67. But the results are Mr. Reflexes and his Chevrolet in the semifinals later this afternoon against a Ford and a Dodge for the FX fuel title. Here's one of the real strong drivers and mighty cars in the factory experimental fuel class and sometimes the gas class, Dick Harrell. Dick, good to see you again. This is the Grand American Finale points champion in the professional stock class. And here's his car, as you can see, sponsored by Nicky Chevrolet of Chicago. How long have you been in Chicago there, Dick? I've lived there about six months, Pete. You were from New Mexico? Yes, originally from New Mexico. I've lived in New Mexico and uh, Arizona just most of my life. Actually, you got most of your fame in New Mexico. It must be rather difficult for you to pick up and, and move to a whole new section, leaving all your friends behind? Yes, it sure is. Uh, we've run all over the United States for the last two years, so I was pretty familiar with most of the country, but it was real hard leaving all these good Texas and New Mexico people. Well, they're still with you, Dick. Listen, uh, one of the questions I get, and I think the people here can, watching can see this, wherever you go, huge crowds follow and, and gather around your car, even when you're working. Does this bother you? No, not too much, Pete. I feel like that if they're that interested, that uh, just let them be, because I enjoy talking to people, and sometimes I can help them, and at least I know if they're watching us and they're all behind us. Let's take a look at this championship Chevy of yours, Dick, and see what makes it go. If you'll tell us, well, how much uh, away from stock is it, actually? Well, the body shell and all is uh, basically a stock Chevy, too. We've added a tube front end assembly, installed a larger engine, and uh, fiberglass components for the lightweight, and that's just about it, the extent of uh, the modifications. And now what elapsed times will it go? Well, we run 920s and 930s in the quarter mile at 153 miles an hour. In the eighth mile, we run 598, 123 miles an hour. This is from a standstill. Dick, what does it feel like when, when you ride in a car of this type? Well, I don't know. I guess for the first time, someone that has never been in one, it's quite a thrill. And uh, you realize the speed you're going. But uh, most of the racers have worked up to this speed, and it, it isn't much... Uh, worse on us other than just driving a family car really because uh, we're aware of the speed and it just uh, doesn't seem like it's there. Now you wear a flame suit and other protective gear it must be a little dangerous. Oh yes, well, we know uh, the trouble that uh, other cars have had and uh, with fires and etc and our associations are real strict enforcing the rules because a lot of people don't realize the danger in running these cars and we have to use shoulder harnesses, seat belts, full roll cages, and a complete protective fire suit. What about the work? How much work do you have to do, Dick, when you're actually in a car? Well, uh, inside the car, you're pretty busy because you figure nine, under nine and a half seconds and a quarter of a mile, you don't have much time to think. So you have to be pretty fast and think hard with everything you do because if anything happens, you have to be ready 
to combat any dangers in the car. Thank you very much. Dick Carroll, our real champion. Dick? Thank you, Pete. Here is a race with the flavor of a grudge match. This is Don Sappington of Scottsdale, Arizona, on the spectator side, challenging Butch Leal of Tulare, California, in a quarterfinal event of the Mr. Stock Eliminator. The Mr. Stock title is worth $600 cash, but Sappington really wants revenge. After losing to Leal in the FX Gas Finals last night, and this is his last chance, for as we learned earlier, Leal is giving up that Plymouth. The California Flash has sold his car. What's the what's in the future for Butch Leal? Uh, well, this guy sold it to Tommy Rogers, and we're we're building it right in process, of building it right now a new uh, Hemi Cuda at uh, maybe approximately about 1,700 pounds, and we hope it runs 790s and 180 miles an hour. When is it going to be coming out? December. It's a '67 model uh, with a tube frame and stuff. Oh, we'll be watching for that one. Butch Leal, one of the real nice guys of racing. Thank you, Butch, very much. Now we're ready on the line. Don Sappington with a new Chevy 2327 against the California Flash making his last appearance in the 426 inch Plymouth. There they go. Sappington put a whole shot on Leo. He is now a full car length ahead of the Plymouth. And he's keeping the lead. It is Don Sappington, the Chevrolet, a winner with 11.22 seconds elapsed time at 119.20 miles per hour. Back at the start line, it's another quarterfinal race in the Mr. Stock Elimination Bracket. That's Tommy Richardson's big red Dodge, the one which earlier was involved in that photo finish with Joe Muscaneer for his class trophy, now facing the 66 Corvette Stingray of Mangrum and Sibley. The Betty, powered by the 425 horsepower version of the 396 cubic inch engine, is in the Ultra Stock Ultra class and is handicapped at three. Richardson's windshield wears the handicap number six, so he'll be given a three spot or 90 foot starting advantage. And now let's see what he can do with it. It's Kenny Mangrum off the line. The pit lane is cut. Richardson keeps the advantage at the start. And through the eyes first, it's Tommy Richardson. There'll be no elapsed time since he didn't cross the start line, but his winning speed is 101.13 miles per hour. Here's another handicap race with Mike Maidens and the Red GTO on the pit side starting three spots ahead of Ken Bradley's 440-inch Corvette Coupe. Only this time, it's going to be different. The Betty wins, charging off the line to pass the Pontiac with a 122.95 miles per hour top end speed and 11.34 seconds elapsed time. Here comes the by now familiar looking topless dodge of Ray Caps, the Mesquite, Texas headhunter, who took the measure of one of the meet's pre-race favorites, Doc Spence, and his Scootin Cuda on his way up to the semifinals of the FX Fuel Class. Caps has drawn a bye, which means that with only three cars left, he will not have to face anyone this trip, running through the 1,320-foot course by himself. And the very least he can earn is the $600 runner-up money. Since he now qualifies to race the victor in the match between Dick Harrell and Gas Ronda, Nothing fancy in his preparations. Caps is off in a hurry. And look at that Mike Dodge dance when he trounces the fuel pedal. Ray Caps, the headhunter. And the elapsed time on the single run is 10.11 at a leisurely 124.30 miles per hour. How important do the drivers consider these races? Well, that's the American Hot Rod Association's professional points champion, Dick Harrell, pushing the broom himself to be sure that there are no particles of anything to spoil the bite in his lane when he faces off with Gas Ronda in that quick Mustang out of Russ Davis Ford of Covina, California. Gaspar Ronda came from behind to beat the CKC Chevy with a time of 9.28 and his 9.26 qualifying time is still the low ET of the meet. And here's Mr. Reflex's Dick Harrell of the Windy City, whose wild car and friendly manner have won him popularity all across this racing country of ours. He's ready with that candy apple red super sport Chevy 2 to do battle with Ford for at least $600 runner-up money and a chance at the whole $1,000 prize in this factory experimental class. These are the fierce competitors, finely tuned engines, almost a thousand horsepower with TNT in their fuel tanks. 
It's great sport to watch, but for the drivers, when they get 2,500 pounds of car moving at more than 150 miles an hour, it can get hairy. There's plenty of danger for these boys, because when everything works right, they almost fly. And sometimes they even do that. For instance, watch how Harold's car leaps up when his tires soak up that benzene traction aid. That's so light. And this will be some race. It's the gas Ronda Ford on the pit lane, a 427-inch single overhead cam power plant against the 427 Chevrolet of Dick Harrell in the near lane. Now, watch him. Look out, Harrell is losing control. That's as close a call as you can have without getting hurt. The Chevrolet careening right at the Ford and missing by just inches. Ronda gets the victory with a 9.32 elapsed time and 151.77 miles per hour. Harold, despite the control problem, clocked 9.82 at 141.50. But the important thing is that both men are alive and unhurt after narrowly missing a high-speed collision. Here comes Dick Harrell in that wheel-standing super sport. And he'll be checking his car for damage, no doubt. The winner is also stopping here on the top of the hill. Let's see if we can get a word with these drivers. As you might expect, both drivers appeared to be a little shaken after that close call. In fact, when Ronda, who's normally pretty quiet, came boiling out of that Ford seconds ago, his first words were shouted at Harold. He said, hey, Dick, I run a heck of a lot better when there's only one car in my lane. And as Gas said, he, he does better when you're not in his lane. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> what happened to you there? Well, the car got up in the air, both wheels off the ground, and drifted to the left real bad. And when it gets sideways, you, you don't dare back out because the tires run low air pressure. It'll roll over on you. Well, Mr. Chevrolet, you lost to a fine car, too, didn't you? I sure did. I respect the Fords very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Dickie. Thank you. There you go. Well, Gas Ronda, you're a finalist now in the uh, factory experimental fuel. Yes, uh, it's a, gee, it's a pleasure to meet you. Well, I felt like a uh, sporty car driver on that run. You know, I had to go around turns, but uh, uh, I'm uh, happy I came through anyway. Let me ask you a few questions about that run. First of all, uh, did you have it full out all the way through, or well, did you have to back uh, off a little one, Dickie? Yes, on? I had to back off to make the turn, and uh, uh, of course, when you do that and you back out of it, you're going to lose your ET and your speed, but... Uh, it all worked out, so I'm happy about it. Your engine's still running strong? Uh, yes, it's uh, had a lot of runs on it, and we have to do some work on it soon. Uh, uh, by that, I mean change oil and check mm -hmm. our bearings out, because when you run fuel, you know your oil doesn't last you very long. Yeah, in spite of the somewhat unprofessional appearance of Ray Cap's car, which is just being repainted, he runs strong. Oh, yes, he does. I, I really enjoy watching him. He's the funniest man I think I've yeah. ever met. He yeah. really, I really enjoy watching him race. And don't you know he's happy when he wins? <laughs> oh, yeah. Who is it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Here are some top stockers in motion. In the far lane is Willie Wagner of Kansas City, Kansas, with a 409 Chevy called White Lightning. And leading him is Bill Helcher of Irving, Texas, in a 327 Corvette called Mr. Bardo. And the Corvette wins, turning the quarter mile in 11.88 and 111.29 miles per hour. And still in the top stock eliminations, it's a 396 Chevelle in the pit lane with a five-spot advantage over Ken Bradley's 440 Corvette. They're off! And oh, that car will be with us for a while. It looks like he severed a drive line. That's the driver, Jerry Bailey of Springfield, Missouri, getting out. Now looking under the car at something. And we can see it too now. The oil from a blown transmission leaking onto the track. A tough break for the team of Bailey and Alexander. It'll take push power to get this car back into the pits now. Meantime, Ken Bradley of Dallas takes the victory with an ET of 13.55 and an easy 79.49 miles per hour. Now here comes one of the big ones for the day. The final race in the factory experimental fuel for $1,000. Gas Ronda in a Ford Mustang from California. Against Ray Camps, the man who beat the Seitz Brothers Barracuda. Now they're ready to run, so let's watch them. Uh oh, red lane in the pit lane. Ray Camps disqualifies on a jump start. Leading early has cost him this race. And it's a tough break for a colorful champion as the headhunter gambled on a quick green light and lost. So Gas Ronda wins the big money in FX Fuel, $1,000 with a 9.31 elapsed time at 146.10 miles per hour.
Apparently, Caps had the right strategy. His ET was 987, so he needed all of the edge he could safely take. Unfortunately for the Texan, he fell over that edge. So let's get the reactions of the loser and the winner in this race. There's your factory experimental field championship of the meat gas Ronda. What a beautiful race. Thank you very much. Now, uh, the video showed us uh, you coming off the line slow and just, you know, you made a strong run, but it, you didn't beat Caps on the video, but of course, uh, Ray did red light, didn't he? Yes, well, I, I saw the red light, and there was no sense uh, me beating the machine because we have some more runs here yet, and, mm -hmm. uh, so I decided to take it easy. So what, what do you feel like when a man, when you win by a red light? Is it, is it this victory all the same? Well, uh, when you run a car and you see that the other person uh, has a much quicker car, uh, he really doesn't have anything to lose, so he's going to take a chance. And sometimes I think the man with a fast car has a disadvantage because you can't afford a red light. You have to wait for that light. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get beat many times this way, but that's the gamble that you have to take. In other words, you have to give him that little edge. Right. right. Well, it was a beautiful run anyway, and you've come to a real strong field. Who was it that was the man that beat in the meet? Uh, I don't really know. Uh, uh, I'm a stranger. Uh, this is the first time I've ever raced in Texas, and I don't know who the man was to win uh, or to beat, I mean. Uh, so I can't really tell you. But you ran the big strong ones. You ran Harold and you ran Caps. That's right. I, uh... I uh, run everyone as hard as I can run, and well, that's the only way I know how. Well, we're real proud of you. Gas Rondo, Factory Experimental Fuel Champion of the Meat. Thank you, Gas. Thank you very much. I was just a little quick. I couldn't help myself. I couldn't do no better. I couldn't wait no more. Well, this again, we've said it before, this is your biggest purse so far in all the time you've been racing. Yes, sir, is it. And I guess it just means that you ought to work a little bit harder, and maybe the next time you'll take the first prize. Next time I'll be a little bit slower <laughs> out of the start, and then I'll come faster down here. Well, you didn't lose to any slouch, did you? No, sir. I mean, if I'm going to get beat, I'd rather beat him than one of them others, because he runs a whole lot better. Here are some middle stock cars now. In the pit lane with a two-spot advantage, it's Doyle Erick in a 1957-292 Chevy called Lucky 7. And off the line, it's the Hemp Hill McCombs Ford, a GT350. The Chevrolet gets the win with no elapsed time since he couldn't start the clocks off that spot. But we record 101.80 miles per hour for his top-end speed. In this middle stock event, the Ford gets a one-spot or 30-foot edge. The pony on the pit side belongs to Chandler and Beavis of Longview, Texas. Their opponents on the people's side is the Fort Worth-based Chevy Del Rey of Phillips and Durham. The 289 cubic against Ford Mustang stays in front and crosses the finish line first at 102.15 miles per hour. David Atkins of Denton, Texas, in a Chevy 2 called Agitation, starts off the spot on the spectator lane against Cliff Canal of Carthage, Missouri, smoking that 283 Chevy off the line. Passing Agitation midway, and it looks like Canal going on for the decision. Canal's ET is 1250 seconds at 110.02 miles per hour. Here now are two little stock eliminators. On the line is Jerry Awey of Grandview, Missouri in a red-hot Mustang against the world's fastest Corvair, the Rudolph Chevrolet, entered by Don Coley and John Lynn of Scottsdale, Arizona. It's starting seven spots or 210 feet ahead of the Ford, but it's going to be close. The Mustang is playing catch-up, but there just isn't enough room and the Corvair is through the ice first, turning up 85.95 miles per hour. The supercharged and open-class racers are next. These are the anything-goes cars with no weight or equipment limitations whatever. Except, of course, the required safety gear must be present. The roll cage, the scatter shield over the clutch and pressure plate assembly, the flame suits and helmets, and the seat belt and shoulder harness. Some of these cars you've seen before in the FX fuel class. Now, though, they're probably lightened somewhat and burn a higher percentage of nitro. This truck is the lightest machine at the meet and has the smallest engine, but it could just be the fastest, too. It's the 1,400-pound 289 cubic inch Ford Bronco Buster from Garden City, Michigan, driven by Doug Nash, and matched against Mr. Reflex's Dick Harrell in that Chicago-based Chevrolet. An injected Chevy 2 against the super light all-fiberglass pickup. Harold has the pit lane, and Doug Nash is on the people side, and this one ought to be a dandy. Ski Chambers, the flagman, is bringing them up to the mark, and this race is just about underway. Dick Harrell gets out in front first, but what's that final keeping in sight? He'll be close to the finish. Great race! It's Dick 
Vaquero with 9.60 at 142.63 miles per hour. Doug Nash blocked 9.57 seconds in a screaming catch-up effort. And right on their wheels come two more cars in the supercharged and open, sometimes called the Run What You Brung class. In the far lane, it'll be the bright new star on the Texas racing scene, Ray Caps and his Hemi Dodge the Headhunter, runner-up in the FX Fuel competition, and already a $600 winner today. Against one of the real crowd placers from California, Dale Armstrong the Canuck. Armstrong had engine troubles this morning, and while he was still trying to solve them, we asked him about his problems. What's wrong with the Chevrolet? It looks like you're down here. Oh, we're having a bit of trouble with the blower. Uh, we haven't found the trouble yet, but I hope to before elimination. How serious the trouble? How did you know you had some? Oh, it just seemed to pull good and low and second, and then seemed to taper off in high gear. We found the blower had a cracked bearing in it last night. We got a new blower, but... I don't know, we seem to have trouble with the drive now. So how slow are you actually going? Oh, we're only going about 138 today. Last weekend we were running about 152. So there's something definitely wrong. In just a moment now, we'll know how well that troubled Chevy 2 is running after all of Armstrong's labors as these two topless race cars are ready to go. It's the Canuck in the spectator lane and Ray Caps on the far or pit side. Armstrong's off to a good start, he's out in front. Apparently that six supercharger just let go, and the Canuck is broke in the middle of the strip. Ray Cap streaks across the finish line with a 10.01 ET at 142.85 miles per hour, while Dale Armstrong limps through the lights with plenty of problems still. We may have a problem with the weather before we get through. Those wet skies are beginning to close in again, and the rains could fall at any time. But the races will continue as long as the track is dry. Here are two more Run What You Brung boys. On the pit side, it's the Seitz Brothers Barracuda from Kansas City, a national champion still going hungry for some Texas dollars. Against the Chevelle of Erickson and Willard out of Wichita, Kansas on the near side. The Chevrolet comes out of the hole first at the green line, and he's going to beat the Scoot and Cuda. This is just not one of Doc Spence's better days. As Erickson and Willard turn on the victory light in the spectator lane with 9.51 seconds and 146.10 miles per hour. Now it's Chevrolet versus Ford in a revenge race for the Chevy as the CKC fastback out of San Antonio in the pit lane takes on the Russ Davis Mustang from Covina, California for the second time today. Gas Ronda drove that pony past Fritz Callier in the CKC machine during the second round of FX Fuel. And now here they are, matched again in the supercharged and open class. Watch him. I believe CKC got away this before Ronda, but the Mustang is passing at the halfway point. And through the eyes first, it's Gas Ronda with a 9.40 and 151.51 miles per hour. That was a great race with a lot of thrills, and that's what drag racing's all about. We have the president of the American Hot Rod Association, Jim Tice, standing here with us. Jim, how did drag racing get it started? Oh, it started at uh, on the salt flats, really, uh, Pete, uh, uh, on a top speed basis. Uh, the lake beds of California, the salt flats of Utah, shortly before World War II. And then uh, we started uh, racing sort of on the street. Uh, and a quarter mile distance was uh, just sort of stumbled on by accident, really. I imagine the local policemen love that. They uh, didn't like it very well. And uh, of course, we don't condone this type of thing. Uh, it took us a while, uh, in fact, about 10 or 12 years before we really got legitimate first-class, uh, safely engineered drag strips. How long have you been president, Jim? Since 1960. How's it grown since then? Uh, we've grown approximately 600 percent. 600 percent. Is it getting bigger or you think it's diminishing? No, we're getting bigger. Uh, we have sort of a tiger by the tail, Pete. Uh -huh. It's uh, getting large so fast that many problems are manifesting themselves as to management, but uh, the sport itself is growing very rapidly, and uh, we look for great things in the next year or two. Now here comes the Mr. Stock final race, worth $600 to the winner. It's the Ford of David Gerard of Texas in the pit lane against Don Savington's Chevy 2. The 
27 Chevrolet lifts off the line first and takes a car length lead over the Texas Thunderbolt at the start. It's Don Sabington of Arizona all the way to the big money in Mr. Stock with 11.9 seconds elapsed time and 119.20 miles per hour. Dave Girard turned the quarter mile in 11.89 seconds to take the $300 runner-up money. There are three cars left in the top stock and Helsher Hill owned Corvette Mr. Bardo drew the by so here goes Bill Helsher on a single run in the semi-final round. And that quick Corvette turns out a 12.43 elapsed time at 106.38 miles per hour. The other semi-finalists in top stock don't have it so easy. Ken Bradley has to come off the line plenty strong to make the five-spot advantage of Del Blades in his Phoenix-based Chevy 2. And it can't be done. Del Blades defeats the big Stingray with a 104.77 miles per hour performance off the spot. Back in middle stock, John Jenkins of Dallas in a 150 series Chevy called Squeaky against the Rudolph Corvair, which started with a five-spot lead. And he keeps that lead. The victory goes to the Corvair with a speed of 87.04 miles per hour, no elapsed time off the spot. Limbering up those muscles in the pit lane is the headhunter of Ray Caps, ready to race Dick Harrell, Mr. Chevy, in the semifinals of the Supercharged and Open Championship. Crosses the line a winner on the people's side with an ET of 9.50 seconds at 136.15 miles per hour. Here's the other semifinals s and race. Gas Ronda in the near lane against Erickson and Little on the pit side. And it must be getting late because Gas was left sleeping on the line. But look at him come up now. He's overtaken the big Kansas Chevelle and it's Ford winning with a 9-2-3. A new low ET for the meet at 152.80 miles per hour. A thrilling race to be sure as Gas Ronda makes it to the $800 finals against Dick Harrow coming up in a few minutes. Jim, how fast do you expect these funny factory experimental cars, stock cars, will eventually go? I think they'll go 200 miles an hour. Please. Really? Certainly. Uh, they're going to get a little better streamlining, uh, a little better suspension, uh, more like the dragster type suspension. And uh, we have some of them going over 175 now. Mm -hmm. I feel that they'll go 200 within the next two or three years. Well, what do you think about the dragsters then? I don't know how fast uh, these people are going to go. I feel very strongly that they'll be in the six second elapsed time bracket. As you may or may not know, uh, they're running in the low seven second elapsed time uh, area now. I feel I'll go uh, 250 for the next two years. Now, this, this drag strip is about 4,200 feet long, including the safety runoff area. It is considered one of the finest drag strips, but, but that doesn't sound long enough if you're going to have drag strips going that fast. Does that scare you a little bit, and what are you going to do about it? Well, for one thing, uh, we're trying to get uh, new uh, braking uh, and stopping systems, such as a fail-safe system. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, a one-control handle system which would apply the brakes, deploy the chute, turn off the fuel, etc. all at once. You were for the driver. Yes, he's very busy down there at the other end uh, of the uh, racetrack, and uh, for that reason, uh, sometimes they lose control. Do you feel that the driver can't do it fast enough? I think that when he reaches for it, it might take him as much as a half second, and uh, at 220 miles an hour, you travel 320 feet a second, Pete. That's a football field. Yes, it's a little over the length of a football field. A little over 100 yards. It makes you stop and think? Yes, it should make us all stop to think because um, most of us don't realize how fast we're going uh, when we're driving any type of vehicle mm -hmm. in, uh, insofar as feet per second and also as to uh, reaction time as to how long it's going to take us to put our foot on the braking device, get it stopped. And that's your prime concern, isn't it? As the president of the association, you're safety conscious, aren't you? Yes, we, we really uh, work very hard, Pete, with the uh, teenage uh, hot rod groups around the country and getting them to drive safely on the street and to race safely on the drag strip where they're supervised and uh, where we have a, a very good safety record. 
Well, many law enforcement agencies have said so. We agree, and I'm sure you do, that drag racing is not a bad influence on the children. As a matter of fact, it's a good influence. It does teach safety. It certainly does. Uh, the police chiefs' uh, associations have endorsed drag racing, and uh, many individual law enforcement officers in the various cities. I know uh, in my hometown, we built a drag strip there in 1955, and uh, complaints concerning street type racing uh, decreased by 96 percent once the strip was installed. So drag racing is safe and it's a whole lot of fun and it is a real sport. Hundred thousand dollars on the stock and fuel hot car meets and about 90,000 people out to see them. We're a grown-up sport now, Jim. Yes, uh, we're a grown-up sport and we have uh, with the uh, growing up we have a tremendous responsibility and we must accept the responsibility in order to maintain our present growth, Pete. Well, I hope all the members and non-members alike listen to and will follow the words of Jim Tice, president of AHRA. A real pleasure, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. As can happen at any major drag meet, a combination of rain delays and an extra large field of fine cars has put these World Point Championships into overtime. But despite the impending sunset and the overcast skies, we think we can still provide pictures good enough to tell the story of these last few races. This is the top stock final with Dell Blades of Phoenix in the far end against the fastest Corvette in Texas. And the victory goes to the Corvette. Bill Helsher of Irving, Texas, with an elapsed time of 11.80 seconds at 116.42 miles per hour. The Little Stock Championship is between the world's fastest Corvair on the spot, 180 feet ahead of Leon Philp out of Arlington, Texas, coming off the line on the spectator's side. And the Corvair is not going to give up that lead. The win goes to the team of Comey and Lynn of Scottsdale, Arizona, with an 86.87 miles per hour finish. Doyle Eric and his lucky seven Chevy out of Irving, Texas, is one spot ahead of Cliff Connell in the white Chevy 2 as they start the race for middle stock honors. There they go. Eric keeps the lead coming off. But at the halfway point, it's Connell coming on tough. And through the eyes first, it's Cliff Connell of Carthage, Missouri, middle stock money taker with a 12.46 seconds and 110.56 miles per hour. Well, we'll finish this day's action under the lights. And this is the race we've been waiting for. The Chevrolet of Dick Harrell on the left of your picture, the spectator lane, against the fire-breathing Ford of Gas Ronda. As these two top stars of the drag racing world go even off the line for the $800 first prize in the supercharged and open run with you run class. And more than that, it's a return engagement for Harrell, who was beaten by Ronda earlier this afternoon in FX Fuel competition. Harrell's best time today in that Chevy 2 Supersport was 9.60 turned against the Bronco Buster. And Gaspar Ronda holds the low ET of the meet, a frantic 9.23 seconds when he came from behind to eliminate Erickson and Willard. But now they've cleared the lights and this race is about underway, so let's watch and listen. Mr. Reflexes jumps first. Harrell has the lead halfway down. Ronda is moving up. He passed him in the traps. The winner is Gas Ronda in 9.18 seconds. A new low ET for the meet set in the last race and 154.37 miles per hour. An exciting climax to a great weekend of drag racing. We'd like to thank the members of the American Hot Rod Association and their president, Jim Tice, for their courtesies the staff and management of Green Valley Raceways for their hospitality, and the stars and their cars for some thrilling races. It's been our great pleasure to have given you this look at America's fastest growing sport, drag racing. Until next time, this is Pete Talmadge. Thanks for looking in.